Hello, everybody, and welcome to this interview from Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. My name is Heather Thorstensen, and I am the manager of communications for Sigma Xi. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Jan Achenbach. He is the 2016 recipient of Sigma Xi's William Proctor Prize for Scientific Achievement. He is also the Walter P. Murphy and Distinguished McCormick School Professor Emeritus of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Engineering Sciences and Applied Mathematics, and Mechanical Engineering at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. The Proctor Prize for Scientific Achievement is a prize that Sigma Xi gives out to recognize a scientist who has made an outstanding contribution to scientific research and who has also demonstrated an ability to communicate that research to scientists in other disciplines. So thank you for speaking with me today, Professor Achenbach. Let's start by talking about how you got into your research area, which is about mechanical waves. How did you get started in that area? I was a uh, graduate student at Stanford University and my project was waves and vibrations in, in this was just uh, shortly after uh, Sputnik when the United States was making a big attempt to catch up with the, the Russians uh, and put its uh, their own object in space and so I was in the I was in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford University, and I was asked to study waves and vibrations in solid propellants. And I did that, and that was the topic of my PhD dissertation. And then when I was finished, I, I, my interest in waves and wave propagation in solids continued over many, many years, and I'm still interested in waves and solids. And your research in waves and solids led to two national medals. You got the National Medal of Technology in 2003 and the National Medal of Science in 2005. Could you talk about the research about wave propagation in solids that led to those medals? Yes, there is a, a field which is called non-destructive evaluation. And the purpose of that field is to, to detect flaws in, uh, in structures. Uh, any structures could be airplanes, bridges, and uh, nuclear reactors. We use the terminology safety critical structures. If one of those structures would fail, uh, possibly a good many people would, uh, would die in the failure. So there is a field that, uh, that, that uh, makes sure that the planes are safe, at least safe from structural failure that bridges are safe and that nuclear reactors are safe. And that's called nuclear, that is called non-destructive evaluation. And I became interested in that field uh, back in the late 70s. At that time, the field was uh, of a more qualitative nature. As you probably know, ultrasound is a high frequency sound that, that can penetrate solids and that can, uh, as it penetrates in solids, uh, will be reflected or scattered by flaws. And that is the purpose of non-destructive evaluation, to detect flaws and, and uh, other undesirable uh, flaws in, uh, in, in structures. So um, I did that for aircraft uh, in the beginning. And uh, we did that for a number of years. And what we did was, in the first place, we made the field more quantitative. When I started off, the field was qualitative. The, the equipment was available, and there were very competent technicians who would look at signals that were generated by, the, by, those, uh, by that equipment. But they could, they could tell that there was something but they couldn't tell the details of it. They couldn't tell whether it was a crack or a, or a small cavity, where it was and how big it was. And so the field had to become quantitative. The Q had to be added and it had to become QNDE. And I worked on that at the very beginning and developed ways of doing that. And, and um, 
and, and setting up a theoretical work that, that would make it possible for ultrasound to be very specific and to characterize flaws. I might mention that I, I uh, after I finished at Stanford and before I did this, I wrote a book which is called Wave Propagation in Elastic Solids. It was published in 1973. It's, uh, it's still available in paperback and uh, some people call it the Bible of, uh, of waves and solids. And, and the, the, the work that I did for quantitative non-destructive evaluation was very much based on the discussions that I had presented in my book. So once we had done a lot of theory, we moved over to, uh, to verification and to do new tests. And an interesting, we did a number of tests, but I, I'll give you an example uh, of the sort of tests that, that uh, turned out to be very useful for, for uh, airline companies. At that time, which is, was back in 1995, there was a plane which was called a DC-9 and uh, it, uh, it, had, uh, it was made by uh, McDonnell Douglas Aerospace, a company that does not exist anymore, it was taken over by Boeing. They flew that plane and then they, uh, they, 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 they wanted to test the wing for stress corrosion cracking and to do that they had to take off the complete wing and send somebody uh, with a, basically a flashlight to find out if there was stress corrosion cracking. And what we did was we developed an ultrasonic method that did not require to, for, to take the wing off, but to do it from the outside of the wing and to detect cracks and corrosion that way. And that was very useful for, uh, for McDonnell Douglas. And that kind of activity eventually led to me receiving the, uh, the, the, the medal for, uh, the National Medal for uh, Technology. Whereas the theory that I had developed actually earlier led to the uh, National Medal of Science, which I got two years later. So it's all about making sure that you can understand how many flaws are in there as well as being able to do this in such a way that you don't have to take apart the structure in order to find out how many there are. That's right. And you should, all, you should push still a little further. If you can find out how many flaws there are, you should also be able to make a statement whether the, the a repair is required, whether a structure should be uh, for a plane should be taken in for maintenance or for a bridge should be should be repaired uh, just on the bridge. The same for nuclear reactor. So that is an, uh, has become an uh, important part of the field also and it requires a lot of interaction with uh, material science and with engineers from material science departments. And so the field has become more interdisciplinary over the years. In addition to material scientists, we also need electrical engineers because the sensors have become very sophisticated and the, uh, the, the processing techniques have become very sophisticated and uh, we cooperate with electrical engineers to get the best results. Could you explain what it is about the ultrasound and how it actually works to find these flaws? Well, ultrasound is sound and sound propagates, as you know. It, it takes sound to go from one source to a receiver elsewhere, even when people speak to each other. Now, sound comes in, is defined by frequency there is low frequency sound and there is high frequency sound. Low frequency sound is the sound that we ordinarily use in talking to each other. High frequency sound is frequency, is sound higher 
with a, with a frequency higher than 20,000 uh, cycles per second. Frequencies are measured in cycles per second. Uh, they're sometimes called hertz after a scientist uh, in the late uh, 19th century. So ultrasound is sound higher than 20,000 cycles. And whereas most sound is reflected by solid surfaces, ultrasound penetrates solid surfaces. And if you just think of a uh, comparison with glass, uh, light penetrates glass. But it can also be reflected by glass. Ultrasound penetrates, so penetrates a solid material, like a metal or any other, a, a, the body of an individual to detect uh, tumors or to make uh, images. Uh, so ultrasound can do that because it, it has this high frequency and the corresponding short wavelength that makes it possible to have it uh, penetrate solid bodies. But at that high frequency, it can only be generated by electronic equipment or by lasers and not by, uh, by any other ways. Is it always ultrasound frequencies that you're using when you're doing the quantitative non-destructive evaluations? Yes, sometimes at very high frequencies in the megahertz range. And a megahertz is a million cycles per second. That's very high for uh, certain materials we have to use that. For other materials we use uh, 50,000 cycles or 200,000 cycles. There's a whole spectrum of frequencies that is being used for different structures. Okay. And how have you been able to communicate the significance of your research on wave propagation in solids to other disciplines? Well, as I told you, I wrote a book which uh, got a lot of circulation and was, was used in uh, courses. And then um, I attended uh, meetings every year even when I was much younger than I now, um, there were always a good many meetings in different areas. That was one way of doing it. And I am at, at the university, and we have departments of material science and engineering, and a, and a department of electrical engineering. So it's very easy for me to get in touch with uh, in the, in persons, professors uh, in other departments and to discuss with them uh, certain problems that I might have. Okay. And what sort of other disciplines, scientific disciplines, has this research moved into? I read about like structural health monitoring and that other uses besides aircraft or, um, or building yeah. structures. Yeah, well, uh, let me explain the difference between non what is generally called non-destructive testing and structural health monitoring. For non-destructive testing, let's say of a bridge, the equipment is taking and the sensors are uh, attached to the, to the bridge uh, as the equipment is there. The same for, you, for, nuclear, for most of the time for nuclear reactors. A plane you would take into a maintenance facility and use equipment in the maintenance facility. Now that was the original way and it's still being done most of the time that way. But now that more sophisticated and smaller sensors are becoming available, these sensors are permanently installed on aircraft or on bridges or in nuclear reactors. So you don't have to go and then the uh, information can be wirelessly transmitted to a uh, a central, central receiving point and then to a point where it can be processed. So already to some extent and in the future a lot more, uh, it will not be necessary to go out to bridges and nuclear reactors and to bring planes in because a lot of information can be obtained from the sensors that are permanently installed in, in those structures. 
Okay. So when you're talking about structural health monitoring, those are the sensors that are on there all the time. That's what that means? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then um, I also read about non-destructive testing and evaluation and quality engineering. What is that part of it? Well, let's make sure that, that products that companies sell don't have flaws in it and are properly, properly done. And so before, uh, let's say, an automobile company would sell a car, they might check a, a few locations to make sure, make sure that everything is in good shape. And so that's quality control, which is done by the use of uh, non-destructive testing. Okay, one thing that we didn't talk about was the um, big application that you had for your wave propagation and solids research with the Aloha flight. So let's go back and talk, make sure that we talk about that. Um, okay. What was it that brought you into that, um, that situation? Well, I, uh, I learned about it uh, and I was immediately interested in it uh, because I was a student in, uh, in aeronautics. Uh, because I had studied aeronautical engineering, I was interested in airplanes. And then more information became available. And um, uh, I am, uh, and then the FAA became interested. The FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration. They're responsible to make sh for the safety of aircraft. They have regulations and rules on how planes have to be maintained and what you can do with a plane and what you cannot do with it. And so the, Fed, the Federal Aviation Administration immediately started a number of projects to really find out what had happened. And I, uh, I applied for one of those and uh, was funded by the FAA. And so I started work in that area. And uh, uh, with other people, I was not the only one, uh, we figured out what had happened and how it could be uh, prevented. I can, I can tell you in detail how it happened, if you like, but uh, the main thing is that, uh, Bo Bo that uh, McDonnell Douglas, no, Boeing, who was flying, who had manufactured that plane, made appropriate uh, changes in the manufacturing of the plane so that it would never happen again. And it was ever actually a 737, the B737, which in due time became the most popular plane that Boeing ever made, and they sold more of, more of them than any other plane. So everything worked out after this particular failure had been recognized and had been corrected. I can add one thing to my discussion of this, which I did years later. When you do this, the work I did, I did and non-destructive testing. It's sometimes very difficult to work with specific numbers. Everything is not really de as what we call deterministic. You're not, you, you definitely do not know everything when you set up a, a test procedure. And uh, you do two things that I didn't talk about. You uh, design a measurement model for a specific testing procedure. And that measurement model includes everything. It includes the equipment to generate the ultrasound. It, it includes the ways the ultrasound enters the structure. It uh, includes the ways how it's being, uh, how it interacts with us. And it uh, includes the ways uh, it, uh, it is measured, and we call that a measurement model. And I was very active also in developing measurement models. And uh, that probably also played a role in the uh, National Medal of Science. But then later on, I realized that nothing was specific and deterministic and that we had, used, had to use probabilistic techniques. So in other words, a certain property might not be known exactly, precisely with a specific number, but it might be known over a, a small range of possibilities. 
And if you do that, then you enter the range of probabilistic analysis, and you don't say anymore that something either fails or not fails, but you say there is a certain probability, hopefully a very small probability, that something, something will fail. Uh, and if it's not small enough, then of course you have to do something. So that's a work I have done recently, uh, not recently, but over the last three years on uh, on the uh, Aloha uh, problem. So was it mostly the, was the, the reason that the um, top of the aircraft came off mostly because of cracks in the aircraft? Yes, well, you know, in aircraft you have lab joints, you know, can you see me? Mm -hmm. This is a lab joint. One plate, another plate, and there is a, a region in between where the connection is made. And the original plane had made that connection with an adhesive. And then they had reinforced it with rivets. Now, in, in, uh, in, in Hawaii, there's a lot of uh, humidity in the air, and there is also a lot of, of sodium and salt in the air. And the salt got in that lab joint and, 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 and uh, deteriorated it. And then the, the loads had to be taken over by the rivets. And these rivets had what were countersunk rivets. Uh, that's a little bit more explained, difficult to explain, but I think a lot of people who listen to me will know what countersunk rivets are. And they produce so called stress concentrations. And if if you have concentrations, concentration, and if you have a plane that takes off frequently as it does when you fly from one little island to the next one in, the, in Hawaii, then you have lots of cycles on such a plane. And there is a phenomenon called fatigue, whereby metals can fail without really being subjected to very high loads. Just the fact that you have a uh, that you have that you have uh, changing loads, you know, if this were flexible, and if I would be able to bend it, and if I would bend it many, many, many times, you can try it with a coat hanger, and you will find out it'll break eventually, even though you're not pulling all that hard. And so that's the phenomenon of fatigue. And the fatigue that created little cracks coming out of a rivet hole, and there are neighboring rivet holes, and then the cracks coming out of two neighboring rivet holes would propagate towards each other and create a, a tear. And once you had one tear, you, had a, you soon got a bigger tear, and the tear went all the way by the first class until it reached a very strong area near the wing. And then it ran, uh, it ran at the other side, and it ran towards the cockpit, and the area, the, the top of the co cockpit uh, cabin between the cockpit and the wing blew off because of the tear on both sides. And this was a, a fantastic pilot. It happened at 20,000 feet. And, uh, and only one person died, the uh, cabin attendant who was standing in the aisle. She was sucked out of the plane, but the, uh, the uh, pilot was able to land the plane. And so it was possible to find out exactly what had happened. And was it solely because of the, the um, quantitative non-destructive evaluation technique that you developed, is that the reason that they found out what happened to this plane, or were there other projects going on at the same time that helped? Well, they, they found out what happened to the plane when the plane had landed. But the non-destructive testing technique then was designed to prevent it ever happening again. And I saw also one other thing that you did in your career was you started a journal called Wave Motion. Yeah. And I was wondering, 
what kind of contributions have you seen come out of that journal to the field of the, um, the wave propagation in solids? Well, I had the idea in, in 1978 or so, and I knew that, that uh, people in many fields were writing papers about wave motion uh, to apply to their specific problems. But the foundation was often the same. They used the same basic equations. They just had different applications. And there were also uh, many papers in fluids that involved waves. And I thought it would be nice if there were a journal where uh, people who did anything in waves, whether it was they were actually uh, whether it was a non-destructive evaluation in uh, geophysics, in in other fields, uh, uh, medical fields, where they use uh, waves to to, to image. Uh, would have a journal where they could pu publish their result and to make their results known to persons who were in other areas. You know, because so this wave motion journal uh, was supposed to deal with basic ideas in wave propagation applied to different areas. And it still is. I'm no longer the editor in chief, but it still, uh, it still has the same idea. So did you see any um, interdisciplinary science come out of that where people actually making connections because they were reading different papers that they normally might not have seen about waves and they were applying it to what they were doing? Yes, I think so. I, I think uh, I personally uh, learned a lot about papers that were in the area of uh, earthquake engineering and of, of geophysics that were published in the journal. Uh, I, uh, after a short time, I appointed uh, an individual field to be a member of the board of editors so that we would get more papers in that area in the journal. And that worked out very well. And I did the same thing for other areas. So I, I, I made a board of editors that had uh, uh, persons from very different fields in it and they would deal with papers in their own field and then uh, have them reviewed and pass them on to the journal. That's a smart way to get the papers that you that you need to fill in what you're missing. That's right. Okay, and so could you talk about the value that you see in getting that interdisciplinary science together? Well, I think it makes everything that is being done more, more efficient and more effective. And it also is a good uh, way to get things done sooner and earlier. And in fact, uh, at Northwestern University, we, we try to bring in students from other, from different departments and certain courses, so they can, they can get to know each other and start working together at a very early stage. Science and engineering, and science and technology is becoming more and more complicated, and it is really necessary that in many cases, to use inter, an interdisciplinary uh, approach. Okay. I also read about a, another area of your research, and I'm not sure if it's very familiar with what we already talked about, but it's that you developed methods for thin layer characterization by acoustic microscopy. Yes. Uh, you're familiar with, uh, many people are familiar with an acoustic microscope. Mm -hmm. which, you, which, which enlarges what you see, what, what, it, what can be seen at, at the surface of a, of a solid. Now an acoustic microscope penetrates the solid, but it still acts as an acoustic microscope. And its, its main difference with other techniques is that it focuses. You know, if you have a curved lens, like an optical microscope has, you can focus light. If you have a curved transducer, a, tr a transducer is a, is, a, is a device that uh, produces ultrasonic sound, you can focus ultrasound. So you can focus ultrasound under the surface of a, of a, um, of, of, of a solid. And uh, we used it uh, to determine the mechanical properties of thin layers. You had to get, to get information there. 
of uh, inside those layers of the material behavior. Now so we have an, we have an acoustic microscope here at Northwestern. Okay, and so could you explain what that what you mean by a thin layer? Well, thin layers thin layers can be used uh, for various reasons. Thin layers can be used to protect the surface uh, of, of, of structures against uh, thermal effects. You know, if, if, there is a, if there is a lot of heat, thin layers can all be also be used in electronic devices where they actually play an important role in producing the uh, output of an electronic device. And so um, they, have, they have multiple applications. Okay. I also saw a big thing that your nominators wrote about you was how much you do for mentoring students. And mentoring is a big thing at Cygnus I where we try to promote mentorship. And I wondered if you had any advice for other mentors out there. Well, it's true. I've done quite a bit of mentoring. Uh, I've done mentoring of graduate students of postdocs and, and, and now and then of young faculty members. Now, you know, at universities, we, we uh, faculty members uh, have projects which are funded by uh, agencies of the federal government, or by the state, or from uh, from company by companies. And um, graduate students work on those projects as research assistants. And that's how they can afford to go to graduate school, because they don't have to pay. They can just work for a higher degree, like a master's degree or a PhD degree, but they do have to do research on a project. Now, that's a limitation that limits mentoring a little bit, because students, have, you have to tell students in the very, at the very beginning that you will respect their individual ideas and you want them to have individual ideas, but they have to have them within the context of these projects. And uh, so I've always given my students a lot of uh, freedom and a lot of leeway to do what they like. The only thing I really had to insist was that what they did would fit in the pro my projects. And the same thing for postdocs. And so that has worked well for me. Other things I do is I make sure that graduate students learn how to write. So I ask them to write uh, papers that we co-authors, at least first drafts. Uh, I ask them sometimes even to write a contribution to a proposal. And they learn to write uh, before they would leave here. I also ask them to to make presentations, to give uh, lectures uh, for my the group that worked with me, or at uh, at meetings, national and international meetings. I think that's very really important also for students before they get their degree. And finally, if there if there was a student who wanted to become a faculty member himself after he was finished here. I would try to arrange that he would do some teaching here. And so all that uh, kind of, uh, you know, you can add up and, and I think those are good things to do. You should never put too much pressure on students, not to bully them. <laughs> That's one thing you certainly should never do. And I know that have been faculty members here and there and the other place where that has happened. It's a very bad thing to do. And the faculty members, they also can use a little mentoring when they start off because they don't have, have all that much experience in teaching. And if they start teaching a course that I have taught myself in the past, I can tell them what the, the difficulties are that students usually have. I can tell them what to do and what not to do. And one important thing that I also often tell them is that they should not overestimate how important, how uh, smart students are. Uh, if, if students are, are smarter than, than, than you think they are, you find out pretty soon and you can adjust. But if they are not, 
you can get old because they can't keep up. And you have to go slow down and you have to do all kinds of makeup things and so forth. So make sure that you are that you properly understand the level of knowledge of your students. And as far as, like, we also have Sigma Psi members who are students, so they're probably wondering how to find a good mentor and how to approach a mentor. So what are some of the ways that you have appreciated being approached when you were asked to be a mentor for a student? Well, we, that's a one good thing we do at Northwestern. Students come in, and uh, at the very first weeks, we organize presentations by all the faculty, faculty members that are able financially to support students or that are otherwise interested in, uh, in, in, in having students work with them. I'm talking about graduate students now. And, um, and so the students get to know a little bit about these professors just by listening to them. And then uh, after that, they're still in the first quarter, they can visit a number of students in their offices and they can discuss the kind of research that they would do, the, ge the general area of the research they would do if they would work with that specific professor. And for undergraduates, well, they have time. They have a whole year in, the, uh, in our department to make up their mind what they want to do. So it sounds like you would want a student to come to you and really learn about your research before deciding to work with you as, as a mentee. It uh, works both ways. I also like to know something about students before I say, okay, you work with me. Yeah, that's good. <laughs>